This is the Dr. Beter audio letter, box 16428, Fort Worth, Texas, 76133. Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is July 15, 1975, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 2. As I say these words, the United States of America stands on the threshold of troubled and turbulent events. The scheming plans of the Rockefeller dynasty to seize total control of America are about to enter the critical period of economic disaster which they have deliberately planned and brought about, and they intend to turn the resultant political turmoil to their own advantage. The political and economic chaos which David Rockefeller confidently predicted a year ago will soon be upon us. The incredibly powerful Rockefeller dynasty controlled by David Rockefeller and his brothers Nelson, John D. III, and Lawrence is still on track with the plan to take over America completely and replace our Constitution with a dictatorial new one which has quietly been written for their use. I revealed this basic design in my audio book tape of October 1974 about the coming Depression and War and explained it in detail in my AUDIO BOOK of March 1975 about the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. But, my friends, there is a hopeful new wild card in the deck which has just recently started gaining momentum. I refer to the fact that opposition is beginning to arise where there was no effective opposition before, and for the very first time. The four Rockefeller brothers are beginning to lose their grip here and there on important parts of their fantastically complicated program of conquest. Their vast pyramid of power is still basically intact, and they remain very much at the top of it. But little cracks and seams have begun to show up caused by the pressure of exposure of their plans. This is only the beginning, my friends, and we dare not leap to conclusions or relax and become complacent. Even if their dangerous monopolistic power should be broken and our beloved Republic saved, we, the American people, must take care that we do not go back to sleep and let someone else do the same thing all over again. In light of what I have just said, I would like to discuss the following three topics today. Number 1. First signs that the four Rockefeller brothers are beginning to lose their grip on events. Number 2. Super-secret domestic military preparations for massive unemployment riots. And Number 3. The secret Central Core Gold Vault that the Fort Knox visitors did not see in September 1974, and how it was used in the theft of America's gold. In recording this today, July 15, 1975, I am making this crucial information public for the first time anywhere. Topic No. 1. Indications that the Rockefeller Brothers have begun losing their grip on things began some months ago in connection with their efforts to suppress the Fort Knox Gold Scandal, and I mentioned this in my AUDIO BOOK on that subject. But only very recently, within the past several weeks, this situation has started spreading dramatically. Even their own grip on the major media has begun to loosen, and things are starting to leak out now that would have been unthinkable only a year ago. A prominent example is the New York Times. Columnist Seymour Hersh recently dared to write a stinging attack 
on the Rockefeller's Private Detective Agency, the CIA, and the Times dared to print it. In another instance, the Times has recently focused attention on the fact that the White House refused to accept Russian dissident exile Alexander Solzhenitsyn because it might not square well with the official policy of détente, that is, appeasement of Soviet Union. Furthermore, the Times published at length from a speech in which Solzhenitsyn attacked Russian Communism in blistering terms. As another example, just a few days ago the New York Times ran an article on the front page which not long ago would have been lucky to show up as an abbreviated filler on about page 67. The item dealt with testimony before the United States Senate in which Exxon, the most visibly under Rockefeller control of all the hundreds of huge companies they own, admitted making political gifts to the Italian Communists, whose recent big gains in Italy you have no doubt noticed. The New York Times is only one example. There are stirrings of independence among some of the other major media as well. It is a hopeful sign. Another recent symptom of the developing turning of the tide was a non-event, the abject failure of Nelson Rockefeller to make good on his plan to oust Gerald Ford and replace him as President by June 1975, which was last month. As of the date of this recording, in fact, he has been pointedly omitted from the now official Presidential campaign of Gerald Ford. What is more, President Ford now appears hale and hearty, and I can now inform you that he has been successfully cured of a powerful virus of unknown origin which caused his widely publicized difficulties last month abroad. Rockefeller's failure up till now to grab the Presidency does not guarantee that it won't still happen, but it does reflect some important reversals, and time is now beginning to run against him. The plan is still essentially on track, but it is beginning to fall behind schedule. One of the recent reversals was precipitated by Nelson Rockefeller himself several months ago during Senate debate over the filibuster rule. Presiding over the Senate, Rockefeller flaunted time-honored procedures, steamrolled right over everyone who got in his way and caused a near revolt on the floor of the Senate. In the melee, one of the Senator's Senators shouted, You do not own this body. He should have added, Not yet, because that is exactly what Nelson Rockefeller has been expecting to do soon through his new Constitution, under which he would be empowered to abolish Congress and then reconstruct it with his own appointees and others manipulated into office. The filibuster flap has caused at least some of those in the Senate to start gradually coming to their senses, not so much out of their great dedication to representing the wishes of the people, which they ignored when they voted overwhelmingly to confirm him as Vice President in December 1974, but out of fear of what he might do. Even former Senator Sam Irvin, who seems to see now that he was used as a pawn in the Watergate affair, has had second thoughts. He recently said in a radio interview, Had he known last fall what he knows now, he would never have voted to confirm Nelson Rockefeller as Vice President. Another fact which is throwing off the dynasty's timing is the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. Even though it is still under wraps so far as the American mass media 
are concerned. It dealt the Rockefeller interests a staggering blow last month, June 1975. Speaking through the United States Treasury, David Rockefeller expected to persuade the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to sell its gold hoard, and the Rockefeller interests were poised to buy it secretly, thereby completing their worldwide corner on gold. To depress gold prices so that they could then buy the IMF gold at bargain basement rates, arrangements were made for the United States Treasury to sell off another pittance of gold on June 30, 1975, in a so-called Dutch auction. Under this arrangement, all successful bidders uh, buy at the same price as the lowest successful bid. Many financial articles have pointed out that this curious setup was a prescription for pushing down gold prices and that the, pre and that the Treasury has for some time been campaigning to do just that. Now you know why. The June 30 gold auction was held as scheduled but it did the Rockefellers no good. The reason? At the IMF meeting in June they failed to get the IMF agreement to sell its gold, and for only one reason. The French Government, through its own intelligence sources, has now been able to confirm my charges that America is gold poor. They know that the United States does not have the huge gold hoard which is officially claimed, and therefore that the Treasury threat to use it to hold gold prices down is a gigantic bluff. Therefore they refuse to play ball, that is the French, and now the Rockefellers are feverishly seeking a way through accommodation or pressure to remove the French obstacle to their gold corner. In the meantime, they will try to hold the price of gold down and the dollar up. All of this is also helping to delay Nelson Rockefeller's seizure of the Presidency of the United States. Still another factor has to do with Nelson Rockefeller's recent sudden trip to England. You probably heard about it in news reports that claimed it was merely a vacation but was not announced up to the last minute for security reasons. That, my friends, is not the truth. Nelson Rockefeller was summoned to England in no uncertain terms by the British Government. They are now becoming increasingly aware of the role the Rockefeller Empire has played in Britain's economic strangulation since World War II and was invited to come there for discussions and negotiations that was less than cordial. It involved economic and financial matters. As a final example of the way in which Rockefeller plans are beginning to go awry, there is the matter of President Ford's visit to Spain during his overseas trip six weeks ago. If you listen to the news closely, you may have noticed that while Ford and Kissinger were mentioned as visiting other leaders, they only mentioned that Ford went to see President Franco of Spain. It was not generally emphasized, but Secretary of State Henry Kissinger did not accompany Ford to see the Generalissimo. The reason is that Franco sent a very blunt message forbidding Kissinger from coming with President Ford. Franco is well aware that the coup a year ago in neighboring Portugal was engineered by the CIA on behalf of the Rockefellers who are greedy for control of the resource-rich Portuguese colonies in Africa and the gold which the Portuguese Government held in its National Treasury. And he also knows Henry Kissinger's central role in the Rockefeller CIA apparatus. What Franco had to say was therefore only for Ford to hear. 
Franco's message to President Ford was clear and blunt. First, the United States must immediately withdraw the CIA operatives who are now trying to destroy Spain as they did Portugal, or the United States will be expelled from all of our military bases on Spanish soil. Furthermore, Franco said that if the United States does not put a stop to the internal subversion which is making America an unreliable ally, Franco would soon be required uh, to make America leave the bases anyway. Thus Nelson Rockefeller and his brothers can no doubt sense that in a number of areas they are indeed beginning to lose their grip. Even the Portuguese coup d'etat, which the CIA and others worked ten years to bring about, has not yet produced all the planned results in that the prized African colonies apparently have gotten out of their control, and the kingpin of their economic war to take over America, the theft of our gold, as part of a worldwide gold corner, threatens increasingly to erupt in their own faces as a scandal of mind-boggling proportions. Yes, a hopeful new eleventh-hour trend is now beginning in opposition to the dictatorial plans of the Rockefeller Brothers, but if anything, we must increase our vigilance now in at least one respect. The danger is always present that, seeing the walls beginning to close in around them, Nelson Rockefeller and his brothers may at some point, quote, hit the panic button and try to hurry things up before they can be stopped by an increasingly aroused American public. In this connection I now turn to Topic No. 2. In recent days I have received very reliable information from certain confidential sources that a highly secret domestic military operation is now underway within the United States with the code name Operation Garden Plot. About six months ago large shipments of so-called riot control equipment suddenly began being funneled to key American cities. Among the cities included are San Francisco, Chicago, Houston, Dallas, Philadelphia, Detroit, and St. Louis, among other cities. As of now, however, Boston, New York City, and Washington, D.C. are not involved. These shipments are reportedly in preparation for unemployment riots which are anticipated possibly by early autumn. Apparently these will be no ordinary riots, though. All kinds of up-to-date heavy riot control gear are included such as sawed-off shotguns, face shields, helmets, gas masks, flak jackets, nightsticks, and gas dispensers. But in addition, the shipments include war material such as M60 machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns, M16 automatic rifles, Jeeps, trucks, and five kinds of Army tanks, M48, M110, M109, PC-113, and PC-577. You may well have seen tanks and other equipment being shipped by rail recently without knowing its possible purpose. Should unemployment riots in fact erupt, whether naturally or at the instigation of paid troublemakers, and if they can be escalated to such a level as to call for the declaration of a state of emergency by the President, it could prove to be a domestic Pearl Harbor attack on the American people by the Rockefeller dynasty. Executive Order 11490, signed by President Nixon in 1969, could be invoked. Martial law declared and virtually dictatorial power seized overnight. Whether or not this is the meaning of Operation Garden Plot, I frankly do not yet know, but the dangers are sufficiently real that I want you, the American people, 
to realize what could be the outcome if the threatened unemployment riots do materialize. But wait a minute, you may be saying. Unemployment went down in June, didn't it? 9.2% in May, 8.6% in June, and everyone says an upturn has begun. Just look at the stock market. No, my friends, unemployment is not getting better. It is getting worse. You may recall that the Bureau of Labor Statistics commented that the seeming drop in unemployment was caused by a, quote, statistical quirk. The real story is not being told at all, but it is hinted at by some other numbers you may not have paid much attention to. For example, the number of jobless persons jumped by 1 million in June. There were 7.6 million in May. 8.6 million in June based on published figures, and the number of people who are so discouraged that they have given up on finding a job set a new record of 1.2 million in June, again based just on the published figures. As for the stock market, the manipulation of which is one of Lawrence Rockefeller's specialties, the present upward trend is strictly artificial. Even the Rockefellers themselves are now rapidly bailing out. Many of their controlled companies are now soaking up cash in return for stocks, bonds, and debentures that will become practically worthless after they let the stock market crash. They can and do change their plans whenever they are spotlighted, but as of now their schedule calls for America to be stunned by a devastating stock market crash in the very near future. As in 1929, its effects will reverberate through the entire world. Even if they should decide to put it off, the crash is now only a matter of time. If you choose to remain in the stock market any longer without the benefit of extremely well-informed advice, you must realize that you will be gambling, not investing. On top of all these things, inflation is now being rekindled with a vengeance, as will become all too apparent in the months ahead. The stage is also being set for major deliberate shortages. The new wheat deal with Russia, which could amount to nearly 100 pounds of wheat for every man, woman, and child in America, is one harbinger of this. But centralized control of all major marketing and distribution systems for food and other necessities is the real key. And so, my friends, Unemployment riots are possible no matter how unlikely they may seem to you now. America, the land of plenty, will soon see loss of jobs, rising prices and shortages, all artificial and deliberate, and the result will be hunger. And hunger, my friends, is the most powerful and destructive political tool of all. And now Topic 3. In a moment, my friends, I intend to lay bare part of the story of the way in which our gold was stolen from Fort Knox. But before I do, I want to remind you of why I am doing it. As I explained in my audio book on the Fort Knox Gold Scandal, the theft of the nation's gold was an economic Pearl Harbor perpetrated on the American people by the Rockefeller dynasty in their drive to seize total control of America. As Lenin said, the only way to destroy capitalism is to debauch their currency, that is, to reduce it to worthless paper, and that is exactly what has been done to the United States dollar by the theft of our gold supplies. Even though the average citizen might never know about it, this disappearance of a nation's gold reserve does become known 
in the powerful world financial circles where national economies are shaped, and the result is always economic disaster for the gold-poor country where money ceases to be trusted. All we have now is fiat money, pieces of paper that are only playing the role of money because the Rockefeller-owned Federal Reserve System says it is money. They can have more printed at will since it is no longer tied in any way to gold or anything else of generally accepted value. Over a period of several thousand years, my friends, people have from time to time tried fiat money over and over again. The propaganda you hear today from the Treasury and elsewhere that would lead you to believe otherwise is pure hogwash, and every single time the result have, has been economic disaster and disintegration for the very people who tried it. This is why I keep hammering away at the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. It is not only the most stupendous theft in all of history, though it is that too. David Rockefeller and his brothers expect to make a half trillion dollar profit on their gold corner by the time gold reaches $2,000 an ounce less than two years from now. What is more important is that if we do not get the gold back now and restore a sound footing for our dollar, we will go the way of every other nation, and history has shown that anyone who has relied on fiat money will lose, and the Rockefellers intend to pick up the pieces. With that background, I just want to read you an affidavit which was obtained by one of my associates from former Congressman Frank Shelf of Kentucky. We have distributed this affidavit to many influential people as part of our effort to pry the lid off the scandal, and recently it was published in part by various financial newsletter writers uh, which, are, which penetrate financial circles uh, worldwide. This affidavit is as follows. Affidavit, State of Kentucky, County of Marion, I, Frank Shelf of 216 East Main Street, Lebanon, Kentucky, 40033, being first duly sworn on oath, hereby depose and say, 1. That I was a United States Congressman from the 4th Congressional District of Kentucky for 22 years, ending January 3, 1967. 2. I have always felt that the gold supporting our currency is a vital component of our economy and should not have been sent abroad nor anywhere else. We are giving money we do not have to people we do not know in order to please people who hate our guts. 3. In August 1963 I charged that the United States Government was moving gold quietly as a church mouse out of Fort Knox and that the gold was constantly and surreptitiously on the move. Four. I learned of the Fort Knox gold shipments from my civilian friends in my native county of Hardin. 5. In January 1965 I made a new request for information regarding gold shipments out of the Government storage vaults of Fort Knox. I sent this request to President Johnson in the telegram. Fort Knox is located in my 4th Congressional District. In response to my previous requests for gold removal information, Treasury officials had been courteous and most friendly, but always non-committal or evasive. As a member who had entered into his eleventh term in Congress, I felt I had the right to question those Treasury appointees who have to do with our gold in Fort Knox in order to ascertain the figures of the gold supply of the United States. I believe the press and all American citizens are entitled to know the facts pertaining to our gold shipments. 6. I retired from Congress after 22 years of uninterrupted service, but I was interested in the United States gold supply because most of it was stored in my Congressional District. The Government was taking gold out by twilight in trucks, and I accused them of it and proved it on them because I had people who were posted there who are friends of mine. They were telling me in the Treasury that they were not taking the gold out but I had friends who told me the hour and the minute when they'll come out for another load. Oh yes, they've taken a lot of gold out of there that they won't admit. It's terrible. Signed, Frank Shelf. 
subscribed and sworn to before me this 7th day of April 1975, and there follows the seal and the signature of the notary public Desi Kessler, the notary public in and for that county of Marion. The recent final emptying of Fort Knox, you see, was not an isolated Goldfinger-style heist, nor was it remotely similar to any of the other ridiculous gold theft movies that you may have seen lately. It was simply the final phase of a very long-term project culminating nearly 15 years of gold removal from America. The hemorrhage of America's gold was begun in 1961 with the initiation of the so-called London Gold Pool Agreement, but the stage was set for all this over 30 years ago during World War II. What I'm about to tell you is more of the Fort Knox gold scandal than has ever been revealed before. Every bit of it is backed up by solid evidence and information from reliable confidential sources. I stand ready to present all my evidence, including authoritative witnesses who will testify under oath. Over a year ago, I publicly challenged the government to test my charges in court and offered to go to jail as a rabble-rouser if I could not back up my charges. Their only public response was to stage the so-called Fort Knox Gold Inspection visit on September 23, 1974, and that too was a total fraud, as you are about to hear. The time has come to make these things public because we have now exhausted our administrative remedies. If you are not a lawyer, you may not realize that you cannot simply walk into court and sue someone at will, especially if that someone is the United States Government. You must establish that you at least have a valid basis for going to court, or the court will not hear the case. The purpose of this is to prevent abuse of the courts through frivolous lawsuits, suits for harassment, and so forth. In the case of the Federal Government, suit cannot be brought until you have exhausted your administrative remedies. This is the general rule. That is, until you have given the appropriate agencies of the Federal Government an opportunity to redress your grievances. This we have now done. We have now gone to Congress, we have gone to the Treasury, we have gone to the Justice Department, we have gone to the General Accounting Office, and we have gone to the top of this Administrative Accounting Office to control the General of the United States. We have corresponded and we have held meetings. We have petitioned, we have pressured, we have asked for answers, and we have received silence, evasions and half-truths. We have given information, and it has not been used. We have explored every avenue available to us for more than a year, and my friends, the Fort Knox Gold Scandal has not been cleared up in any way, just the opposite. To give just one example, there is an official document obtained by us from the United States Mint with great difficulty some time ago entitled, Gold Shipments from United States Bullion Depository, Fort Knox, Kentucky, January 1, 1961 to June 30, 1974. Based on our own strictly confidential information and with pictures, we were able recently to ask the following question of the United States Mint under circumstances in which they were under great pressure to give us a reply. Our question was, quote, What was shipped in the four tractor-trailer loads on January 20, 1965 from Fort Knox to railroad yards across the river to Jeffersonville, Indiana? This shipment does not show, my friends, on the official listing I named a moment ago, yet here is the astonishing answer contained in a letter from Mrs. Mary Brooks, the Director of the United States Mint, dated June 19, 1975, and I quote, On January 20, 1965, 
1,762,381.353 fine ounces of gold from the Fort Knox Bullion Depository was shipped by way of rail from Jeffersonville, Indiana to the United States Assay Office, New York, New York." Unquote. There is no explanation as to why this nearly 2 million ounce shipment does not appear on the official listing, but this violent conflict among their own statements is only typical of the entire Fort Knox fiasco. A year ago the Chairman of the privately owned Federal Reserve System, Dr. Arthur Burns, admitted in a letter to Congressman John Rarick that the assets of the Federal Reserve does not include gold, and yet at the same time official statements of the Federal Reserve did list gold as a prime asset, and they still do today. This discrepancy has never been cleared up, Congress taking a ho-hum attitude about it all. The only concrete result so far is that Congressman Rarick, who had been very popular with his constituents, was washed out of office last November with a sea of Rockefeller campaign funds which went to all of his opponents. It so happens that the aforementioned private owners of the Federal Reserve System are the Rockefeller interests, and they react very vigorously whenever anyone dares to poke around at this keystone of their economic empire. Yes, the time has come to go to court, and while I must still save my actual evidence for court, the time has come to let you, the American people, the jury on exactly what has been done and how. The foundations were laid for the Fort Knox Gold Scandal during World War II when extensive hush-hush modifications were made to the Fort Knox Gold Depository. Originally the Fort Knox Gold Depository building was designed around a huge vault with two levels, the ground floor and the basement. One entered the building through the front entrance you have probably seen often in pictures, passed through a vestibule, and found himself in a corridor running to left and right. This same corridor went all the way around the building on all four sides of a huge vault. To reach the vault door one would enter the building at the front entrance, follow the corridor to the right, and then continue on around the corner and along the right side of the building. Part way down this corridor one would come to the vault door, which was on the left or inner side of the corridor. On entering through the vault door one found himself in another corridor inside the vault. Fronting on this corridor were a series of storage compartments about the size of jail cells I call them bird cages, but with solid metal doors with individual locks on them. These cells or compartments were arranged in a sort of uh, cell block with the vault corridor passing all the way around it. That is, one could head off down this uh, corridor inside the vault, walk around a center cell block with compartment doors facing onto the corridor on all four sides, and finally wind up where he started. There were 20 of these jail cell-like storage compartments inside the vault on the first floor of the vault. There were also stairs uh, with which one could walk down to the basement level of the vault and the arrangement at the basement level was the same, a square cell block of 20 compartments fronting on a corridor which went all the way around. What I have tried to describe so far was the main or outer vault, however it was not where the gold was kept. These small compartments, 40 in all, were for the storage of all sorts of other things secret documents, precious metals other than gold, and a variety of other things. But these were not where the gold were kept. was kept. Instead, there was a sort of vault within a vault known as the Central Core Vault, which was reserved strictly for the storage of gold. Access to the Central Core Vault, which was located centrally and below ground, 
could only be obtained from a point at the basement level inside the outer vault structure I have described. Moving gold in and out of the central core vault was therefore a relatively slow and tedious process, but in the 1942-43 time period major modifications were made to the Fort Knox uh, vault structure under the direction of a mechanical engineer named Stanley Tatum who was serving as an Army Major at that time. A rapid retrieval system for the gold was built in the rear of the depository building where there are a pair of huge doors into which trucks can back for loading and unloading. First the six bird cage compartments running along the rear of the outer vault on each floor were deleted. The vault corridors, which had formerly gone all the way around the cell block on each floor, were then walled off where the row of compartments along the rear had been deleted. Thus the vault corridors no longer went all the way around, but now formed a U configuration with the base of the U turned toward the front of the depository building. By lopping off the rear portion of the outer vault in this manner, space was created in the rear to accommodate the rapid retrieval system. In this space, in the center adjacent to the truck doors, was installed a powerful screw-type elevator passing from the ground floor down and to the level of the central core vault into which the elevator gave access. At the top of the elevator, that is, at the ground level in the rear of the depository building, a massive vault door was installed. In effect, this vault door serves as nothing, serves as nothing but a very elaborate elevator door since the only thing you can enter in when you uh, open it is the elevator, which then takes you down to the central core vault where all gold is supposed to be stored. Finally, the original access to the central core vault from a location in the two-level main vault where the compartments are was deleted. The building's interior walls and decor were then restored to something like their original appearance, but now, thanks to the secret modifications, there is no longer a vault within a vault arrangement. Instead there are now two separate and independent vaults. One is the vault with all the jail cell-like compartments in it which was shown to the visitors last September. The other vault, which cannot be reached from within the vault the visitors uh, saw, is the Gold Vault, the central core vault which can be reached only by the elevator in the rear of the building. The compartments in the vault shown to the visitors were never intended for storage of gold, and, my friends, what the visitors saw last September were not gold bars, not even junk gold. It has now been confirmed to my satisfaction that what was seen by the visitors is a commodity known as show gold, lead bars covered with a layer of gold that is just thick enough to stand up under handling. This even helps explain the high alloy content responsible for the strange redness which many of the visitors last September noticed. Pure gold is extremely soft and a thin layer over lead could all too easily be damaged and reveal the lead underneath. Highly alloyed gold, that is impure gold, was therefore used so that it would withstand handling. Thus they saw junk gold all right, but it wasn't even junk gold all the way through. The visitors of Fort Knox last September, of course, had no way of knowing that there are two vaults and no one told them. They were led to believe that the vault they entered with all the compartments was THE vault, and the Treasury had seen to it that none of the invited visitors were experts on gold, much less on the mysterious legendary place known as Fort Knox. The closest brush the visitors had with stumbling onto the truth came when a reporter asked Mrs. Mary Brooks, the Director of the Mint, why the compartments were numbered in such a curious fashion. 1-14 on one floor and 21-34 on the other. 
Mrs. Brooks helpfully replied that she didn't know. Well, Mary, if you haven't figured it out by now, I'll tell you. The missing numbers 15 to 20 and 35 to 40 are those of the cells that were deleted in the secret modifications during the 1942-43 time period. After the wartime modifications to Fort Knox were made, over ten years were allowed to pass before the next major step in 1954. At that time a super-secret complete inventory was taken of the Fort Knox gold. This was not the same as a relatively cursory audit, so-called, of the gold which was done in 1953. The project in 1954 involved a complete count with weighing and assay sampling of all the gold there, about three-quarters of a million four hundred ounce bars worth a total of $12 billion at that time, and that was at the old price of $35 per ounce. That's twice as much as the Treasury ever claims to have now, and even these claims are complete lies. In addition to all the weighing, counting, and checking against records, the 1954 inventory included the extraction of a plug of gold from every 100th bar for assaying, and these say, uh, samples were sent to assay offices all around the country to minimize the chance of any collusion to falsify the results. This seemingly enormous job was kept completely secret and was completed in only nine weeks. All of the gold was, of course, in the Central Core Vault at that time. None was in the bird cage compartments. The contrast with the so-called GAO audit of the Fort Knox gold last fall can hardly be overstated. The alleged gold stock in 1974 was only half as large and they can only claim to have examined about 20% of that. Assay samples were only taken from only about every thousandth bar. They were not plugged, but merely small chips were taken which could be taken from a uh, corner, say, without cutting through into the lead underneath. All the 99 samples were sent to a single location, the New York Assay Office, and only 54 of these have ever been stated to have been returned with undefined results. Finally, the results of the alleged 1974 GAO audit, which was performed, by the way, by 13 Treasury employees and only two GAO representatives, have never been published. The closest thing to it is a ridiculous little document printed in February 1975 which presents no findings of fact concerning the gold and timidly says only we believe that gold is there. By returning to the 1954 gold inventory, the question arises, why was it a secret? After all, the law requires an annual physical inventory of the nation's gold reserves. This law has been generally circumvented and ignored. but. One would think that when its requirements were satisfied for once in 1954, the fact would have been made public. The reason for the secrecy of the comprehensive 1954 inventory, my friends, is that its purpose was not that defined by law. Instead, the Rockefeller interests were simply taking stock of the American gold reserves which they intended to start spiriting away a few years later. In about 1960, after those who had worked on the secret 1954 inventory were safely gone from Fort Knox, the next step was taken. A system of record-keeping was set up to allegedly keep track of the gold by means of special ribbon-like metal seals on the doors of the compartments in the main vault, not where gold is supposed to be stored at all. These seals had been in use on these compartments ever since 1937 uh, when the gold was initially stored at Fort Knox, but gold was never in those compartments, just other things as I mentioned earlier. Nevertheless, attention was cleverly shifted to the old outer vault 
with the compartments as if that was where the gold was. Seals were put on doors of compartments with gold alleged to be inside, and these seals were thereafter checked by the so-called Annual Settlement Committees in lieu of actually opening the locked compartments and checking the contents. Of course, for all any Settlement Committee thereafter really knew, the compartments could have been empty since there was no way to see in through the solid door of each compartment. United States Mint personnel have recently stated for the record that the peephole through which the 1974 Fort Knox visitors peeped into an unopened cell was drilled especially for that occasion. Thus they were at last ready for the looting of America's gold. The record-keeping system of the United States Mint now reflected only the status of the compartments in what remained of the original outer vault. Meanwhile the gold was actually still stored in the completely independent central core vault, reachable only by means of the elevator in the rear. And in 1961 the looting began under the cloak of the London Gold Pool Agreement initiated that year. Gold began flowing like water out of Fort Knox and the other depositories, arousing the concern of Congressman Frank Shelf and others, but all attempts to stem the tide were brusquely waved aside by Rockefeller agents within our government. By 1968 this gold hemorrhage was used as an excuse to set up the two-tier gold market in place of the London Gold Pool. Further details of the recent events uh, surrounding gold have been given already in my audio book tapes on the coming depression and the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. So here we are, our economy mortally wounded by a scandal bigger than Teapot Dome and Watergate combined, and our government is sitting on it with all the power at its command. Our great Justice Department refuses even to examine our evidence about this biggest theft in history an act of treason, an economic war on the American people. They have more important things to do, it seems, like finding ways to disarm the people in violation of the Constitution they are supposed to defend. The Treasury Department continues to defraud, mislead, and lie about their criminal activities. The General Accounting Office generally refuses to account for anything about our gold in any meaningful terms, and our elected representatives, with very few exceptions, have so far found every excuse in the book to look the other way about the whole thing. Meanwhile, Fort Knox has been completely emptied of its gold, and the American dollar is about to die according to Lenin's words. Therefore, my friends, I continue to appeal to you to make your collective voices heard and your will felt. I have believed all along in this fight that the madness that now grips our government can still be rooted out and our freedom saved, but I am also convinced that only if you and I do our parts as citizens will this happen. As the toolmaker philosopher Tom Wilson says, we the people need to collectively shake our elected representatives like disobedient children and get them representing us again instead of the powerful special interests dominated by the Rockefellers. Until next month, my friends, this is Dr. Beter. May God bless each and every one of you. Thank you.